Good evening, everyone. I hope you can hear me. I should be able to verify that you can hear me in a second. There, there seems to be like a 10 second delay between me actually recording and me actually hearing myself on YouTube, which is pretty cool. Now, I actually do need this. Sweet. So, wow, amazing. I think this is the first week in like a, in like a month or two when I'm able to start almost on time. So, um, one thing, there is no moderator today, since uh, all my usual mods are busy. Um, so, if you have any questions, I'll answer them at the end. I'll try to look at the chat at the end of the live stream, so wait with the questions until the end of the stream. I won't be able to basically look at the chat too much during uh, recording, so yeah, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I guess, yeah. yeah. You get how much I rely on moderators the moment when they are gone. Basically, uh, what are we going to talk about today? I think this is incorrect. No, this is correct because I'm actually going to talk about today the same thing I did talk about last time, which is Confidence, Dragon Sector, CTF, Challenges, which, um, which was again a CTF created by my team and run on the Krakos conference um, two weeks ago. And yeah. And it's, uh, I already talked about my reverse engineering challenge and I kinda showed you the um, Starbite challenge, which was a MISC challenge, a miscellaneous challenge. Now, today I'm going to talk about more reverse engineering challenges and because I didn't really have any good idea what I could talk about today. There are actually co uh, two cool challenges created, one by Redford and one by Adam, who, which which I really liked and I did solve um, for testing before the CTF. Um, yeah. So but basically when you create a CTF, what, what we usually do is like for a challenge to actually be used on a CTF, there must be at least one person who solves it, um, which means that, you know, there's a lot of pressure before the CTF for everyone to solve the, some challenges. So they are actually tested, we know they work, uh, we do have a working exploit for them. Yeah, um, so yeah, I basically focus on reverse engineering challenges. Now, um, mm, what else, what else? Let's maybe move to the usual stuff. Uh, can I correct this a little? Yeah, mm, here we go. Now, usual shout outs. Oh, I, I, do I have this? No, as usual, I forgot to run my... I actually do need to create a script which will just launch everything I need for streaming and change my configs for to, you know, to Vim and so on so the fonts are larger. Anyway, Live Overflow is a really awesome channel about CTFs and security and uh, basically if you want to learn something new or if you're already senior and you want to pick up some tricks from this guy, totally subscribe. Uh, I, I seriously encourage you to subscribe, it's a really cool channel. Just click on this button and you'll get notified um, especially if you click the bell icon, which is like next to it, you'll get notified about, uh, well, all the videos and so on. Apart from that, Mormus CTF is another channel I greatly recommend. He is streaming from US about, um, I believe it's US. Well, it's in the time, of, time zone at least. Uh, yeah, he's streaming about CTFs. He also has a lot of cool tricks. For example, he did some uh, Manticore videos, which is uh, what was requested on my channel, which I never got uh, to do, which is basically symbolic execution used for security. So totally check out his channel, really awesome stuff, and I, I really enjoy watching them as well. Apart from that, this channel was recommended to me on Twitter during some conversation, malware analysis for hedgehogs, totally check it out, um, especially that I know that some of you were, were interested in malware analysis, so it, it seems there is a channel on YouTube about that. I personally didn't look at it yet, but but there is a channel about it, so yeah, take a look. Cool. Mm, now, shout outs to Jay. Jay basically updated his GitHub page with some notes uh, really recently about genetic fuzzing and other stuff. He basically is making uh, notes on security based on um, well, things he uh, he learns from, which includes my videos as well. So uh, check it out. I'm going to give you a link on uh, both on my channel and on on the 
sorry, <laughs> both on my YouTube channel and my RFC channel. Oh, so what the, is the stream going to be about? It's going to be about this, which is just showing confidence uh, CTF again, two more tasks that I want to talk about. Um, now, this is basically the newest hot thing everyone is talking about, which is Qualys Security Advisor, the Qualys guys published a vulnerability in pseudo of all places. That's just epic. And uh, yeah, you have to read this, basically. It's, it's a really good bug, really fun bug. So check it out. I'm going again to paste you the links here and there. Um, I mean, seriously, finding a vulnerability in pseudo is quite astonishing in itself. It's uh, obviously a local privilege escalation. And uh, or de depending on the configuration, might be also, I think uh, um, you can read from any file or write to any file. What, what, uh, I don't remember the details, but check it out. Cool. Now, about the mission number four. There were several solves to mission number four. If you're new to my live streams, the missions are small challenges or tasks which are which I publish at the end of the live stream. So if you wait today until the end of my live stream, then you will basically um, you'll basically see it and see a new mission, mission number five today. And uh, please, uh, if you solve it, post your solution in the comments under this video. Now, last week's challenge was this thing. Now, what is it? Uh, actually, it's uh, already said in the description, it's a UTF-8 thing. At least the agent who sent in this message says it's UTF-8. Obviously, it's hex encoded, but that's just on, for transporting, right? So, um, but, um, well, they say they they tried to decode it, but it didn't work. So what's, what is this about? Why, why do we say that it's UTF-8, but it's still not displayed correctly by any viewer? Now, the, the answer is, uh, as most of you figured out, or some of you figured out, is that it's called overlong UTF-8. Now, usually, um, so UTF is basically a um, transport or encoding format for Unicode. In Unicode, you, as you know, characters have might have really large codes. For example, where, you know, the capital letter A is 41, but there might be like Chinese characters or some math characters, which have like four digit numbers basically uh, in terms of code. So in order to encode a character, you um, you can use, for example, UTF-8. Now UTF-8 uh, for smaller, it's basically like variable length encoding. For smaller numbers, it tries to use only one byte. So it just uses one byte, it has zero here. So from numbers from one to 127 in terms of uh, character code, it actually just uses one byte, right? Easy stuff. Like it's it is identical to ASCII in in case of one byte characters, and it's fully compatible with uh, seven bit ASCII. Now, if characters are starting to get larger, like for example, one hundred twenty eight and so on, it uses two bytes, and then if it again exceeds another mm, another boundary, it uses three bytes to encode them. And now it works like this, but it actually uses additional bits to store the number. So in this case, uh, the X's are the places where the additional bits go. Uh, so as you can see, there are basically here six bits and here there are another five bits. So you basically get 11 bits to encode a number. That's pretty um, pretty much. And it's a number, you know, starting from zero and going up, up to two to the power of 11 minus one. Um, and the standard says that well, if you are going to encode the value 7f, which is 127, do use one bit, uh, sorry, one byte uh, encoding. But if you encode a larger value, do use this encoding. What happens if you actually like say, hey, I have this value, which is rather small and it falls into this category, but I want to encode it with using like four byte encoding. Well, nothing stops you from doing that, but actually you just put it with zeros, right? So you put zero, 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 and 41 basically fill, fits in here in these last six bits pretty well. So yeah, you can do it. It's incorrect according to the standard. It's called an overlong UTF-8 because you could have encoded this 41 using one byte, but you decided not to. And there are some fun bugs in browsers, for example, in the old days. And by the old days, I mean like 10 years ago. Then they, that's why 
most modern stuff basically when it sees overlong utf8 it just says no i'm not going to decode it this is probably an exploitation attempt um and just to be safe on the safe side they just ignore characters which are not cor correctly encoded so if we go back to the uh, oh i can actually zoom using this button i didn't know that so if we go back to this uh, all of these characters are act actually what i i just said overlong encoded ascii characters No, excuse me. Now, um, there is at least one write-up by H for Stur or Hastur. I have absolutely no idea how to read your nickname. I'm sorry. I can only butcher nicknames. And uh, overlong UTF-8 was such a fun feature. That's the correct uh, password. That's the message which was, and well, overlong we encoded here. And uh, on his uh, blog, he actually, or, or was it on GitHub, he actually posted a full write-up explaining everything and uh, showing code to do it. So thank you very much for doing it. The link to these slides, which I'm showing, is in the description under this live stream. You, you just like, if you go to YouTube, um, scroll down to the description, there is a link to these slides. And all these, mm, well images are clickable. If you click on it, you it will get you to his GitHub so you can read the solution. So if you didn't solve it, totally check out his write-up on it. And again, thank you for posting write-ups and thank you for posting your codes if, you're, if you solved it, because that helps the basically the beginners who watch my live stream to who tried maybe to solve the task, maybe they were not able to, and now they can read about it or see more experienced people's code to, to know how to solve it. So thank you for posting it. Um, then uh, six other people actually did solve it with and shared, shared the code, and that's uh, Pavel um, Teril, again, sorry for butchering your nickname, and Marek. Um, again, you can click on all of these and take a look at them. Just to save time, I'm not going to to go through through the codes and uh, this time. Uh, Dimitris, uh, Trochedziko, and Artur also shared their code. You can again go to the presentation, click on it. And Adrian was actually the first person to solve it. And uh, the, his comment was first on YouTube in terms of, you know, timeline. Congratulations, well done. Now, mission number five will be available after this live stream. So good luck. And it's a little more difficult this time. Not, not a lot. Now, another shout out goes to Disconnected. I'm actually going to give you this link on channel. He described the Polish mission because on the Polish side of my, you know, my, I also do Polish streams on Thursday and I also post missions there, but they are different missions. He actually posted a description of his solution using Angur, which is symbolic execution. Uh, fully in English, so you might be interested in checking it out if you're into Angor. He did find the, an unintended solution actually to my to my challenge. I'm going to talk more about it today, but I basically did some hashing function and uh, I didn't realize that this part, let's maybe zoom it, that this part, this part has a sign extension and due to that there were other solutions. So he was one of the first people to actually, I think maybe even the first person to post a solution and it wasn't the solution which was intended. So congratulations doubly for, for finding an unintended solution. It's like on CDF, if it works, it works, right? Sweet. Um, oh yeah, <laughs> Krzaku says that fun fact last Thursday was on Friday. Um, this Thursday will be on Thursday, Will. Um, yeah. I probably should not spill water on my desk. Anyway. One thing, if you go to my channel, uh, let's maybe just do it. Did I close my browser? I shouldn't have closed it. Let's do it like this. So if you go to my YouTube channel, well, you are on my YouTube channel. I'm sorry, you are watching my YouTube channel. So if you, let's go there. There is actually a poll like with two questions. One question I want to ask you. If you go here and hover your mouse on this part, there is actually a vote. You, if you're signed in, you can vote whether I should do more programming streams or only security streams. So please absolutely go over and and yeah, and please vote since I'm really curious what uh, what the folks think. Okay, let's do about blank here, and I'm not going to close the browser this time. Uh, 
Yeah, okay. Thankfully, you didn't spill on my keyboard. Now, I actually do have a new computer fully, up fully upgraded, and it seems to work pretty well, though I did have some hardware troubles, it seems, but my old hardware was dying, and I spent all day yesterday to basically copy all the data, and as an image copy, not file copy. It took two and a half hours to copy one and one terabyte. That's quite a lot of time. Now, where do I have these tasks? Oh, I can show you one thing, I guess, before we get through. Uh, I probably mentioned it last time. If you go to bl uh, sorry blog.dragonsector.pl, then... Oh, these are the winners of our CTF, by the way. Yeah, um, Balloon won. Yeah, these guys. Then P4 was second, and Teamless, which is a merge, a temporary merge of some teams, were third. So congratulations. And these guys are organizers. This is actually our acting captain of Dragon Sector and vice captain being Euro or Mateusz Jurczyk. You might know his research. Anyway, so uh, this thing is this, these are the slides for with solutions basically. Uh, from our CTF, and I maybe showed it to you, but now the task, I, I what I want to show, oh, I did talk about this task. It's like all the solutions for all the tasks are here from the CTF. So if you're curious about the task, which I didn't show on the live stream, check out the slides. Now, I did talk already about this task last week, as you might remember, and this is how the logical layout of the VM I was using looked like. So, yeah, that was basically the thing I was reverse engineering. Now, if um, if you did solve Starbyte, which was the challenge I did show at the very end of the live stream yesterday, sorry, not yesterday, last week, obviously, then um, you basically had to decode. I did show only this, and I said you have to decode it to zeros and ones. Now, when you did finish de to decode it, when you did decode it, you got this, which is, well, line, rect, which is obviously a misspelled rectangle, or circle, which is, well, circle. If you created a renderer for that, I actually, the way I do, usually do vector renderers are, I basically translate this into SVG, because SVG is also a text vector format, and then I just run it in Inkscape or whatever. And uh, if you do it, then you would actually get this, which is a space station-ish thing. I'm sorry, I'm not really a good graphic artist, with the flag being um, rendered there as well. The slides are on, I actually can give you the link, but the slides are on blog.dragonsector.pl. Congrats on the new computer. Thank you, thank you. I'm actually quite happy with it. I, It still doesn't work fully, but it's pretty decent. And now I can, you know, I can actually open a couple of tabs in Chrome and it still works. So that's pretty fun. And uh, now, I, the task which I am going to talk about today, I'm not going to spoil it for you. There were two, uh, well, there were a couple of reverse engineering tasks. Um, let me just create a directory for this thing. I think I up for forgot to upload the code I created last time to GitHub. I apologize for that, I'll try to do it after the stream. You know, there's a, like, github.com slash gunveil and there's a stream, like, live stream stream. Uh, dash en for the codes which I create on these streams. Um, I guess I need to find. Yeah. So should the flag is the is the task I want to talk about today, and this is why I opened the slides. This is an S, as in you know a Nintendo. Um, and this is an S cartridge, and actually Adam created a game and like written it on the cartridge and insert the cartridge and it worked and this is a, obviously a security monitor with the game which i'm going to show you in a second and this is a a light gun connected to the nintendo it's, uh, well nintendo console the idea was that this flag here this is a flag here was moving left and right and uh, sometimes it was hovering over over one and sometimes over one sorry over zero and sometimes over one and sometimes it was you know in between because it was just moving left and right left and right and when it was over zero you could shoot it and it would enter zero here's actually here is uh, whatever you 
should it would enter 0101 or like a question mark if you missed or X if you missed as well. So um, yeah, and the idea was that you have to enter the correct password shooting zero or shooting one or actually shooting the flag while it's over zero or shooting the flag while it's over one. Adam actually said there was quite a lot of trouble to get it to work correctly, but but yeah, in the end it, it did it, uh, he did it, so we got a reverse engineering challenge for Nintendo game console, which is pretty fun. Now, uh, let me open this task. So what you got basically was this file, which is ctfredacted.ness. Now, the fun part is that the flag is not there. Uh, no, yeah, that's true. The flag is not there, but the, if you reverse engineer it, the password is there, meaning, you know, the zeros and one, you have to shoot. And if you shoot everything correctly, then you get the flag on the screen, which is, which you basically have to do physically. Now, um, okay, now I'm going to, I guess, show you how it looks on an emulator. I'm, uh, will I show you how it looks on emulator? I can show you how it looks on emulator. I'm using FCE Ultra as an emulator, so let me open it. Uh, can I just drag and drop it? Let's see. Yes, I can drag and drop it, and it actually even works. So, yeah, uh, this is it. Mm, yeah, let's do it like this. So, I think I can even shoot on the simulator, or I cannot? Yeah, I can. I have to, like, push both buttons at the same time. Mm, or something like that. Yeah, uh, as you can see, I cannot even hit the proper number just because of the way the emulator works. Oh, come on. Anyway, so uh, you enter the password basically here. Oh, I, I think I have to have my cursor here. Yeah. And the password is 16 digits long. Now, on if you properly configure the emulator, it actually allows you to enter 16 digits. But uh, what the emulator is really useful for is uh, the debugger, which, uh, yeah, this is the debugger. Let's maybe do this. Now, the way I used the debugger, because I really couldn't make heads or, or tails of this debugger too much. The way I used it is I basically dumped the memory into, dumped the whole memory into ROM. And why I did it? So, you know, I basically started the application and I didn't shoot at all. And then I dumped the memory. And then I shoot once and I dumped the memory. And then I shoot another and dumped the memory. And then I was began looking for which places in memory changed between these shots so that um, actually, you know, X's or O or 1 or a question mark appeared there. Now, um, so that's one one way to start about this. So the second is obviously loading it in IDA. Now, I don't remember the exact place where I found it, but you can find scripts for IDA to actually load .NES files. So if you do, if you try to load this file, you get this, a Nintendo Entertainment System ROM, which uh, IDA by default doesn't have. It it's, it's fully supports the, uh, you know, the mouse uh, CPU, which is a Nintendo game system, but it doesn't really, you have to basically manually load it. And that's a little annoying. So it's best to get the, the plug and the loader for IDA to do it for you. And I guess I can make the font bigger again. Yeah, here we go. Yeah. So, well, when you have this, you also have the addresses where everything is. And you can see that there is ROM, there is RAM, there is more ROM, IO registers and more RAM. And um, it's quite funny because I think the RAM is actually, you can find it in a couple of places. Or the ROM is like on some addresses, it's just duplicated. So, yeah, that's pretty weird. Now, I'm not going to show you the full solution because it would take a while and I, I totally don't know this, this assembly. I had to learn a little about it, but I absolutely don't know it by heart, right? Um, well, I know this is load A, A being an accumulator, one of the registers, and you load two into verb and there's store. So store the two under here and so on and so on. So instead what I 
what I figured I'll do, because I, I also didn't feel like reading all this code. No, seriously, I, I'm, a, I'm a somewhat lazy person, and being lazy on CTF sometimes helps. So what I, what I actually did is I decided, well, if you actually do this kind of stuff, if you have to shoot something and then you have to know if it's right or wrong, you have to have a compare instruction somewhere, right? So like CMP or something. So what I did, I actually like went at the beginning of a code section, right? A beginning of a RAM section and I did alt T and we have written CMP as you can see. And there's one compare here, then I go one, another compare here, another compare here, another here, and one more here, and another here, and here, and here, oh, here there are two of them, another one here, blah, blah, blah. There's actually some of them, not quite a lot. Now, this is interesting. Why would there be so many compares at the basically one after another with some somewhat weird values? And this basically caught my attention, like immediately. So um, now this isn't, I think, registered as a function. I think I can actually find the same code a little further on this memory region as well. So let's just, uh, let's just see if I'm correct. So blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I jumped here. Yeah. Is it it? No, that's not it. That's not it either. Yeah, it's here. Uh, because uh, as I did mention previously, well, the ROM is du duplicated. So it's like this area of memory is identical to this area of memory. It's just the same thing mapped twice into the memory region. So, and Ida did analyze this, it didn't analyze this. So I'm going to focus on this part. Now, if I do this, as in switch into the graph view, I can see that there are some checks, blah, blah, blah. And then it, it does like uh, load A, load X. And based on it, it does some stuff. Now, if you actually know some of this platform, and I did, again, have to learn some basics of assembly, you know that this is basically loading the address. Uh, as in the address is 16 bit because the memory is 16 bit, but the registers are, are 8 bit. So you want to put a 16 bit address in an 8 bit register, you have to use two. So you load the lower part and the higher part. And this is the address. So um, I'm going to actually color it nicely to, let's say this color. And now let's look at this address. I'm going to insert a comment here because Ida actually has a really nice, now it's shift column. EA85, that's one, and EA71, that's the other, right? EA71, EA85. Now, if I hover over it, uh, there is some weird instructions here. That's incorrect. I'm going to undefine it. And yeah, this looks better. Wrong, 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 or redacted, 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 or shots left, that's ASCII. So if I go back and I again hover over it, I know that it's this one is the incorrect branch. It's wrong, wrong, wrong. And this one, redacted, 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 because again, the flag is not here. The flag is only on the game running actually on the NES on the physical console uh, next to the conference uh, and CTF organizers, right? So I know that if we reach this branch, it's incorrect. So let's color it maybe this color. So just looking for compare instructions. As, as you know, it might not always work, it's just a heuristic, a stupid heuristic, but it saved me a lot of time. Now, um, now, so basically the question is also, what the hell is going on here? I mean, where do these values come from? Because Again, there are 16 O's or 1's that you have to shoot in order to get the, the password, to insert the password. Now, 16 bits, it's 2 bytes, and here we have 4 bytes, so there obviously needs to be some hash calculated here. So let's look at JSR. JSR in the, um, in the MS, uh, MOS CPU used on this uh, computer, uh, com well, console actually, the same thing. Um, I don't know if you know, but like even the 8-bit Atari, which had the keyboard and could be programmable and actually booted into basic, um, in the marketing materials, they did call it a console as well. So there was the distinguishment between consoles as thing without keyboards and 
but just can play games and computers which have keyboards was created somewhere later on in the time. Anyway, JSR is basically call. So this is like call some routine. Um, yeah, it's basically like x86 call. Now, uh, it does call some stuff here, some stuff here, and then it starts comparing. So let's go here and let's see what happens here. Well, not too much. So let's see what happens here. Here it's a little more funny because it there is some it calls some other functions, quite a lot of them, and this actually looks quite complicated. If you uh, you probably don't see it too well because it's super small, so let me make it larger. But this is a huge function, and by huge I do mean huge. So one of the usual things you do uh, when you start playing with with this kind of stuff, because I you know I know this is a hash because it has to create some hash, most of crack have hashes. What you do is you look for constants, right? And the constants for default algo algorithms, for example, calculating CRC or MD5 or so on, uh, there are some constants which can be basically, if you find them in the code, you know it's MD5. Uh, let's look for MD5 RFC. And we go here and then we go at the, I don't know, end-ish somewhere here, no, too far. Yeah. Yeah, for example, these constants. So if you basically spot like these constants in the binary, you know it's MD5, right? What I did during the during testing, I spotted some constants here. I don't know where they are right now. Let me close the graph here, maybe. But uh, mm, yeah, anyway, the constants I found here, maybe in this function, maybe in some other function, they were basically. I think not in this function, actually. Yeah, I'm sorry, I am going to find this function. Was it this one? Yeah, I think it was maybe this one. Anyway, the constants which are found were matching to SHA1. So what I did during the during testing, I can actually show it to you. This is not it. Um, well, whatever, uh, or maybe this one. Yeah, it's this one. No, sorry, not SHA1, SHA256. So I copy pasted these. Um, these are the checked, the first four checked bytes of the hash, which I did show you earlier. And I did a brute force, right? So I did like use iter tools, product. This is the character set 0, 1, or X. There could be also a question mark and 16 times. And I brute forced through it and nothing. Like, there are SHA256 constants which I found in the code, and it doesn't find any solution. Uh, that usually tells you that the challenge offer is actually annoying, and he doesn't like you, and he wants to make your life hard, <laughs> which was the case. Well, it wasn't the case here. Uh, there was another problem, but I'll, I'll mention later on. What, uh, so what I decided to do is that, hey, I mean, I am not going to analyze this. Again, I am, I am lazy when it comes to CTF challenges. I am not going to analyze it. If it calculates a hash, I'm just going to use it. Okay, how do I run this MOS CPU code on x86? Well, I obviously have to use an emulator. So what I do in these cases, I basically go to Google and like the, the website, not, not to my work. And um, I look for a, a specific CPU emulator. So in this case, that would be uh, Nintendo uh, Classic um, CPU, blah, blah, blah. So Nintendo Classic Edition is actually, that's not really the or is it the correct name? Or is it the new one? I think it's the new one. Yeah, it's the new one. Um, it's just NASVEN. And the CPU is... Yeah, basically this one. So when I go like 6502 Python and I find a couple of emulators. So yeah, what I did, I basically, I think I even used this one, which is like P65 Emu, whoever created it, thank you very much. It saved me a lot of time. And I, uh, you know, uh, to run a program, you have to 
I didn't want to run the whole game. I don't care about the whole game. What I care about is I care about the hashing function. So um, you might remember that I did the memory dumps, right? And I told you that I did the memory dumps to find where in memory is the password stored. Knowing that, I could create a basically a RAM section or a ROM section where I did put the password, the zeros or ones. And then I could create a ROM section which contained the .NES data basically, well the same ROM section which you see here. And then I created a CPU and I set up all the registers to, well the registers uh, which I read, I made a breakpoint I think somewhere around here in the debugger and I noted down on a piece of paper basically all the register values and I set all these registers to these values and then I run it until it hit a break breakpoint at this point basically and uh, I, well either on this point or, or on this point and if it hit actually this bit uh, this point I did note down the password which I was verifying now the code for it looks like this is it uh, code for it yeah this is the code which I've written for it. There isn't too much magic here. As you can see, I basically also mapped the same ROM section twice on two different memory addresses. This is the same stuff, right? Same stuff because that's for some reason the way it works. And basically this is the way you set up the CPU. I had some funny bug here. Oh, I know, I'll get to it in a second. This is the like PC register, like where to start execution. Then there are the registers with values noted. I didn't know, like, uh, this is actually, I think, the flag register. I didn't know what 6 means. I didn't care either. Again, PC is also being set by me here. And, uh, and yeah, and this is, like, in a function called test. Then I basically run it. I run it until I reach one of these blocks which I said one is correct password and the other is incorrect password and by run I mean I just called step so execute one instruction execute one instruction and so on until you uh, reach it uh, this is I believe the place where I found all the memory locations where I found that the password like zeros and ones are being stored and then I well if when I again executed it and then if PC reached the correct block I returned true otherwise I returned false and here is the same product loop. I use only this character set this time. Um, and for all combinations of zeros and ones repeated 16 times, I run the test with this password. And if it was true, I noted down the result. Otherwise, I just said that is like tested. Yeah, one of many. So this is my solution, which again, it's a lazy approach to, to do it. As you can see, I even, the memory, right, the memory, I filled it with the dump of memory. I dumped the memory, the whole RAM, and I just used it to, to fill the RAM because I didn't want to check what are the values actually accessed by the application and what are not the values accessed by the application. Now, it turned out that uh, somewhere here, I think here while initializing the CPU, it for some reason yeah i know what it did when initializing the cpu it zeroed ram and i was like i deb debugged it for i i think half an hour and until i finally found the line in the emulator that oh on creating a new cpu just zero the ram because the ram should be empty and i'm like no it cannot be empty it has to have my dump so i had to comment it out and that's the way I solved it. So it, it took me like half an hour of debugging of this, uh, this emulator to actually find that problem. In the end, I run it on, um, I guess I can run it now uh, as well. I think I have a version which, do I have a version? Hmm. Yeah, I have a version which was, which I used to run it, it is like slightly modified, it just takes two arguments and it only tests the, the combinations from, from this range of arguments because I did run it on several computers, on several threads because it's actually slow and there is, uh, you know, like 16 bits, it's like 65 
uh, yeah, ha this many combinations. So, uh, so yeah, I had to run it on, and I think it's like it tests like ten combinations per second. So I run it on a couple of threads on my machine, a couple of threads on some other computers I have at home, and uh, finally it did find the correct solution. Let me see if I can actually run it for you. Does it work? Yes, it works. I guess you can see how fast is it. Oh, it's even slower than I expected. So it did take a while. Now I have no, I did note down what was the correct, mm, what was the correct combination number. Maybe I can even show it to you. Maybe I didn't note it down. No, come on, I always note that still down. Yeah, maybe I didn't note it down, or at least I don't know where I noted it down. In any case, um, it basically ran for some time and it outputted me a given 0 and 1. Well, you know, the, mm, the proper sequence. And then I went into emulator. I didn't bother shooting, I just used the debugger to enter the proper combination and I got redacted redacted, which means it was correct. And that was actually um, the best solution. Uh, Foxtrot Trial Charlie asks, what about PyPy? I actually did use PyPy. PyPy speeds it up greatly. PyPy is again the JIT um, Python, JIT Python basically, which means it does just-in-time compilation into machine code, native machine code, which is x86 machine code, which makes it, which is why, again, I said it's about 10, 10 executions per per second. And I think it it was brew, like running for 15 minutes before I found the passwords again on, I think, two, two computers, 12 sessions or something like that. So yeah, in the end, what the players had to do, as I did show you before, unless you just joined, they had to use a light gun on the CTF and shoot the flag to enter the exact solution which they discovered, and they got a flag here on the CRT monitor, which was next to our CTF desk in Krakow. Um, this part is funny because it's actually a drone cage. I'm not going to show you the drone cage, I'm going to, well, the drone task, but I am going to just show you tell you that we had the drone and you had to hack this drone and you had to reverse engineer the firmware that was one reverse engineering challenge another challenge was to basically pwn it into different ways so a pretty fun task created by Valis but today I am going to show you yet another reverse engineering challenge created by Redford uh, it might be here I am going to go back to it in a second but uh, let me close it. Anyway, the, basically don't be afraid to use emulators like Unicorn. Unicorn engine is really awesome for emulating stuff during CTFs and during you, you know, your usual work if you, if you see a benefit. Uh, how did you sprout the load on multiple computers? That's actually an excellent question. Um, the way I did it is I ran Patty and Tmax and I manually entered it, so I didn't use any any automatic way to do it. But the, I mean, for for twelve sessions, I didn't care to look it up. I know I can set up twelve sessions like under a minute, and if I would look it up how to do it correctly, it would take me three minutes. So yeah. Uh, can you use remote shells for computing on CTFs? Yes, totally. Uh, sometimes sometimes it's really quite important actually sometimes there are CTF challenges which you have to have computing power or a lot of RAM to solve and you just yeah you, you have to use a shell for that okay so let's talk about the second challenge the second challenge which I want to show today was called Keegan Keegan was a Windows exploitation or exploitation sorry reverse engineering task um, yeah Keegan and, mm, and that reminds me actually I was supposed to do fancy graphics for it but I never got time to it sorry Redford my apologies yeah so you run it in a console and then you enter 
some password basically and it it's annoying because it says wrong now since it's a windows um, challenge i'm actually quite okay with it because i like windows i, I know windows way better than linux so yeah it's a 32-bit executable for perfect no 64-bit binaries which means you can even use the free ida to work on it uh, okay so let's open it in ida now um yeah there is some console magic i'm actually pretty familiar with this console magic because i believe i actually pointed red for to these functions <laughs> um blah 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 yeah whatever now um there are a couple of interesting things here first of all it d does like reading from the console and so on and uh, mm, yeah, this is just checking what you what did you input let's uh let's just look for wrong and correct and backtrack from there so yeah Control X. So what I pressed was Shift 12 to get me the strings window, and I found wrong and correct, and I'm going to backtrack from that. So Control X to find me where is it actually used, and it's actually used here. And uh, yeah, so what's going on here? There is an if, and if this this byte and this byte, these two bytes are actually set, then we go into correct. If this is not set, then yeah. So this is important important one and important two or maybe zero and one whatever and if we scroll up there's a loop and the loop is what is it doing what is this function uh, v print f mm, i don't know is it scan f it's probably some scan f or something or oh, no it's actually print f maybe uh, let's see where these where these are set. So I go here again, and there are two functions when this is, where this is set, but only one write reference, right? So in the main. So I'm going to look here, and it's, yeah, it's set here to the value of, oh, this is actually an, a return. So like, you know, um, 0a is line feed but 0d is actually like carriage return or is it the other way around no it's like i said it's exactly like i said which is just you know return or enter however however your the key is called on your keyboard on my first computer it was actually called return so let's go here and see what's up here um, because this is the function which actually does the like check correct check good yeah, perfect. Let's call it check good then. Mm. Okay. And now there is some loop here and there is some another function called. Let's see this function and okay, this function is scary. You can already see it's scary, right? So oh and there's some like I love dragons thing going on here as well. Let's focus on this loop. Now, what's going on here is basically it checks if a... Uh, well, I, I guess it's pretty safe to assume that this function actually gets the... Somehow it gets the password you entered, right? And now if it's... Uh, well, it's something like, does something like this. It um, checks if it's a digit, then it subtracts 48. Um, or 55 if it was a digit and then it does multiply by 30, uh, at 36 no multiply sorry multiply 36 oh my god um, and does some moving around so if you know very large integers this you already should know what's going on here uh, this 36 it's there's something called base 60, uh, 36. If we go here and we do go wiki base 36, you can figure it out without knowing it, obviously. But if you know it, it's, it's even um, better. Basically, base 60, uh, 36 is a number system. I mean, it's the same, numbers, uh, same number system as decimal or hexadecimal, but hexadecimals and here at F and 
base 36 actually go to Z. So what you enter actually is a number, and you enter that number in the base 6036 system. And what this, um, uh, where did you go? What this, hmm, where is my code? Uh, sorry, it seems I have to backtrack here again. Okay, so what this code does, it actually decodes the base 36 um, password which you enters, entered and stores it in a, in a very long integer. And the very long integer is uh, base 256 basically because that's, well, that's the way it was coded. And that's the way normally the you know the CPU operates, which is actually base two is the same thing, right? But yeah, it's uh, it stores the digits as bytes normally as uh, the same way as you know a 32-bit int is stored, but this time it's a very long integer. It could be way larger than um, than 32 bits. It could be I don't know. It could be like how long was the password? That's 25, so it's 25 to the power of 30. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm messing it up. Uh, yeah, we would have to do like 25 to the power of 36 and divide it or do a logarithm of that of like log 2. And uh, we would figure out then how many bits it, it is actually. Um, I think it's like, I actually don't remember, but it's uh, a decent size number. So now if we go here and we actually, let's switch to assembly, okay? Assembly is easier sometimes than the, the, the compiled version. It's the scary function, by the way. If you look here, there are quite a lot of moves, quite a lot of RCL, quite a lot of ADC. This already should tell you what's going on here. Now what's going on here is, but basically, you know, this is rotate left, right? So it's like roll. Now, why didn't the author use roll here? Instead, the author used RCL, which is rotate and uh, with carry bit, basically. Or why did the author use here ADC instead of add everywhere? Because that's add with carry. And usually the way, and, and also the way this is chained is pretty much reviewing. It's basically arithmetic operations on very large integers because when you chain a lot of things with carry bit or you chain for example it's like add and then adc 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 then you know it's uh, it makes sure that the last bit which got shifted out doesn't get lost and that it's propagated as the carry bit to the next number it's basically the same way you do you know manual addition is the the thing you yeah i mean sorry if you have like a number like 19 and you add eight to it, right? Then the way they teach you at school, at least what they taught me at school is that you say, oh, the result here is seven, but I have to add one to the next row as well. So this is the carry bit, right? So thanks to using ADC, it makes sure that whatever two digits are being added next and from two registers, like be it like, well, or memory locations, whatever, make sure that the carry bit, the carry flag is actually added as well. So yeah, uh, that's that. Um, now, what you have to do now is you have to basically go through all this graph and figure out what exact mathematical operations are going uh, are going on here. Let me maybe just show you one and uh, like this one. This one is just, if you see a lot of ADCs, it's doing an addition. And uh, you know that the number that is being added is basically pointed to by the EDI registers, EDI, then EDI plus four, plus eight, plus C, and so on. So the number actually is what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And you know that each, each addition is actually 32 bits. So it's a 256 bit number. This is an addition of, two, uh, of a, uh, oh, but what's being added? Being added is here, and so yeah. So this is this is quite funny because the number which is being added it's 128 bits. It's only you know four times 32 bits, but it's being added to a number which is which has uh, eight times 32 bits. So it's being added to a 
larger number, which is 256 bits total. So yeah, this is an operation. What what I did is I basically somehow named these like um, EDX was. I checked where it points at, right? Because if you scroll up, you can find a, a load effective address. And yeah, I know that it's now var 40 and EDI is actually var 80. So what you could do is you could press like, uh, I think, no, this, this funny rename, is it it? No, it's not it. Right click and then there's something called group nodes. This is a, a really awesome feature. And you, what I write here is like var 80 plus equals var 40. And it actually collapses it to a really small block. Now, after doing this analysis, I will show you the final form. Hmm, as soon as I find it. Why do... Okay, never mind. Yeah, here it is. Um, I have absolutely no idea where, where I am. Funny function, it's... Yeah, it looks like my naming. No. Yeah, so this is the final form which I got it into. As you can see, it's way more readable now. And uh, what I did next is I basically transcribed it into Python. So I ended up uh, here. And then after transcribing it to Python, um, yeah, it's some work because you have to remember like to do the, this operation like bitwise and with for example, 128 bits, because uh, you know that some bits might get get lost, right? And you have to emulate it in Python as well. So after basically, do I have, I might have a copy of it. The copy would be more interesting, actually. Yeah, this is the transcribed, um, the transcribed code to Python from, from the IDA, right? And what I started to do now at this point it's basically to figure out what is this loop for, what is that loop for, and so on and so on. So basically start to think about it. And um, what I found out is that there, the loops are actually like loop which is adding stuff and uh, like quite a lot of additions was, was actually, for example, a multiplication. Or when I found a division um, or, a, you know, a modular operation. And uh, uh, what I also found was, I also found an operation which was, uh, mm, uh, you know, it's power. So power but with, uh, with modulo n, with some number. And in the end, after doing all this, I found that the function is... Um, <laughs> where is it? Yeah, I think it's just it, yeah. Um, yeah, I think like the function was something like this. Basically, all the code just, yeah, or maybe, or maybe like this. All the code boiled down to like two mathematical operations, which was like power modulo. And, uh, and the next thing I had to do was basically to figure out what, um, what to do with it from a mathematical perspective. I will not bore you with math. Um, Oh, there's a question, doesn't SHL uh, use CF as well? Yes, it does, but it does it with, uh, it uses it as in it puts the result in CF. However, it doesn't take CF and it doesn't shift the bit from CF into into the register, which is why you, they, they use the offer used RCL. Anyway, after uh, basically reading on Wikipedia about it, it turned out, yeah, I think this is uh, this, the solution, but um, it hardly matters. Uh, the solution was to basically calculate this, which is like a mod inversion of the value, which uh, minus one, and it gave you the correct result and it gave you the flag. Let's try to run it. Um, so, yeah, I guess if you know crypto and you know RSA, it was really obvious after reverse engineering what to do there. I didn't, so I had to look on Wikipedia. And uh, and, yeah, and you had to find a key, and if you entered the key, then it was basically you solved the, uh, you solved the task. Let's try to enter it. Yeah, and it's correct. 
so yeah, this was one of the reverse engineering challenges where multiple solutions were actually allowed, which also happens. Now, um, I guess the, the learning here in case of this challenge was that sometimes don't look at the decompiled version, look at the assembly because it's easier to spot some things. I'm not sure I would spot that it's a very large integer operation just looking at the decompiled version, to be honest. And then at some point do transcribe it to a higher level language and then start thinking what what are you looking at logically because you know there was quite a lot of code which in the end like boiled down to a power with modular operation basically uh yeah so that's about it now oh one thing uh, uh, i forgot to mention about the other task you know the previous task with uh, the NES, the nintendo system is that why did it look like it was SHA-256 and it wasn't? What the author told me after I tested it is that he wanted to make it SHA-256, but the function is too large and it didn't fit into the ROM. Which is which is a valid excuse in all honesty, but not not something you hear every day. So in the end, he had to like basically like cut down part of SHA-256 and in the end put it there in, in that way. So, yeah, that, these were all the challenges I wanted to show you, actually. Therefore, if you have any questions, then I'm going to look at the chat for the next, let's say, 5-10 minutes, and depending if there are questions or not. And then, then that's it for today's stream. I will show you the mission, and that's it. So, if there are any questions, please do write them on chat right about now. Yeah, so I wonder if SHA1 would fit fully into the NES room as well. That's a good question, Shaku. Um, yeah, I guess one I could show you one more thing. I'm not sure if you... Uh, wait, wait, while waiting for questions, if any, you know, there's a delay be between me recording something and, um, yeah. Anyway, uh, I don't know how it's called in English. Let's look it up in Polish and then let's see. Might be it. Exponenting by squaring. Yeah, yeah, this is this is one of the things which I learned during my university years. Um it's it's a method that can be used to do fast large integer math like operations like multiplications or squaring or division. And uh, it's called exponentiation by squaring in this case for, for exponentiation. Now, um, yeah, it's basically thanks to having this in my head, doing this on my university, I didn't have problems with getting that very large integer math computations, the multiplications and the powers into something, well, into something condensed, like the two lines of code, which I got in, at the end. And uh, if you don't know this, then it might be a little harder to actually reverse engineer it. You would basically have to analyze what's going on there and figure out, oh, this is actually a fast multiplication. So, yeah. Where was I studying? I was at the uh, Polish uh, Wroclaw University of Technology. I was doing computer science there with uh, specialization in mathematics, which was pretty random for me, actually. <laughs> Adrian says that the first challenge reminds him of a Binathlon 400. Yes, uh, I will give you the link on YouTube chat as well. Uh, I used the exact same method there, but with a different CPU. I also used the Python instrumented emulator to, to solve the crack me. So, yeah. 
Uh, yeah, and uh, Warsaw University of Technology is actually Politechnika Wrocławska, if you speak Polish. Uh, and uh, do I work as a programmer? I actually all the time during my career, I worked in so-called multi-class jobs. So um, I started basically working in an antivirus company when I did the same time reverse at the same time reverse engineering and coding. I was creating like static unpackers for for packers. Yeah, basically. Then I moved to another company uh, like Hispasec, where I was doing coding, and that was like both in Python, C for Windows, the desktop applications, some drivers for Windows, and uh, like mobile Java applications, uh, malware analysis, penetration testing, and security vulnerability research. So um, yeah, quite a lot of different stuff. And now at Google, I'm basically a manager. Uh, Mm, uh, Sui, which is a programmer, basically, and you know, and all the security stuff that goes with uh, with being in the security team. Um, well, not a lot of reverse engineering, but some. Uh, well, a lot of uh, security analysis of applications, some reverse engineering too, maybe some crypto, some. Uh, well, not a lot. We have a uh, we have really good people doing crypto. You know, like uh, people who did poodle attack, who did crime attack, who did. Um, some other stuff like Daniel by Um Apart from that, uh, nah, I think that's mostly it. I'm still doing some training, so yeah. Which programming languages do I code in? Um, mostly Python, C++, and surprisingly Assembly. But that's, you know, mostly exploits and stuff. Uh, Will I find somewhere on your blog and information about my new PC? Actually, no, I don't think I've written it, but I did, did write my initial configuration somewhere. I think it's Gunvale called in PL slash Haven 2.txt. Um, it's not up to date though. Um, well, it's not up to date here. Uh, the case, I did have to go for another case. This one didn't work out as in, I, I couldn't squeeze in my cooling, this cooling. I, I just couldn't find a place for it. Uh, then I have, this actually is like, it's not 4x, 4x, that's 8x. And I also have a new new hard drive because the old one was starting to die, as in the, uh, one bad sector appeared and that's already a signal for me to change the hard drive. And it also made like funny clicking noises. So that's basically, yeah, that's basically what you see here. Also, uh, uh, this USB card causes blue screens on my window, so I am not using it. Do I code in C-sharp? No, not really. I, I helped one person on my university correct his solution to some task, and that's all C-sharp I know, so not at all. Okay, uh, let me scroll up if there are any more questions, and if not, then we can round it up for today. Hmm. I'm wondering if I have any funny story to share while I'm scrolling, but I don't think that's the case. Okay, uh, uh, how about Rust learning stream? I might do it if you want to see me suffer, <laughs> basically. From what I know about Rust is that you have to get used to the way it uh, handles ownership of, uh, of memory allocations, which I've heard is painful at the beginning. Um, a lot of people try to talk me into learning Rust, so I am going to learn Rust at some point. So yeah, we can do it on stream if you like it, but it's not going to be pretty. Um, Tomorrow on the Polish stream, what am I going to do? I'm going to do an uh, basically OS development part uh, eight or seven or something like that. I don't know exactly what I'm going to do. I think I was last time I was doing interrupt handling. I'm also waiting for Radari two stream. Yes, uh, that too. I agree. I, I have it on my list as well. Um. Apart from that, or any other high-level languages, I sometimes code in PHP. Does that count? Yeah, PHP uh, and JavaScript as well. 
I don't really code in Java itself too much anymore. I never coded too much in it, to be honest, just a little. Yeah, okay. So let's wrap it up for today. Thank you very much for joining me and uh, see you next week, I guess. Uh, yeah, and uh, again, if you have any thoughts on what I could talk about on the next streams, or if you want more programming streams apart from security and reverse engineering, I could also do some programming streams, streams then please let me know in the comments down below. Thank you very much for showing up and I leave you with the mission for today. So best of luck and happy hacking. See you next week. Bye.